There, out on the rocks, lies the battered lifeboat, now high and dry, from which seven men were swept in the biggest gale within memory as they went to the assistance of a trawler in distress. One man escaped. Entangled in the gear, he was flung with the boat upon the rocks and crawled to the farm yonder on the cliffside. W. Freeman is his name. Safe at home, he recuperates from his ordeal. But William Freeman never really recovered, and neither did St. Ives. He survives to this day a perpetual, haunting reminder of a tragedy which has shaped the life of this community ever since. The consequences of the night of January the 23rd, 1939, when seven men perished, have echoed down the years. William Freeman is not by any means the only living person permanently affected. For those who look to the sea for a living, every lifeboat launch can rekindle the pain of that night nearly 40 years ago. The gale still blows and heavy seas still break on the Cornish coast and over the remains of the Alba wrecked last year. has visited this little seafaring community at the extreme end of England, and along the beach, watchers keep vigil for the bodies of the gallant crew who perished in their work of rescue. William Freeman lost everything but his life, even his name. Most people call him simply Survivor. Oh, I've seen uh, ever such a lot of change. Well, as far as uh, the boat it, it uh, affected my life, was I didn't go to sea no more. I haven't been afloat since. Oh, it was terrible. I mean, <laughs> I could sit down and cry in here, really. It's really terrible. Of course, he knew all the crew, you see, went to school with them, and we knew, <coughs> knew them all, you know, their wives, their children. But uh, round about January, we always get a gale of wind round about that week, sometime or other in that week, you know? And of course we we listen and look and wonder if there's going to be another gale like that, you know. The cox of the St Ives lifeboat today is Tommy Cocky. It's a familiar name. The cox of the disaster lifeboat was Tommy Cocking, his grandfather. In this community, the position of Cox carries much prestige. My family had been connected with life for 110 years. I had two uncles drowned in 1939. Grandfather drowned in 1939. My father would have gone in 1939 if uh, he heard the maroons, but he didn't hear the maroons. I don't, I don't want to talk too much about it, if you don't mind. No. It upset me as well, you know. It's a big thing, that is, to me. As many of people in this town now uh, remember that night, and I don't think they'll forget it. What happened next day when everybody knew they was all gone, I don't think anybody will ever forget that. Dick's wife, she lost her husband, and she lost her father, and she lost her brother. And, um... <coughs> I lost my brother, my husband was in, and my... 
first cousin's husband, he was gone. Edgar didn't have anybody there, I don't think, no. His mother was a widow, poor son. But Edgar Bassett, that was his first trip in a lifeboat. And his last. And I had been in the sailor boats before, but I'd never in a motorboat. You see, St. Ives were intermarried and all that sort of thing, that everybody is somebody else's cousin. So I don't think there was a house hardly in town that never had a brownstone. It was a dead town. Here at St. Ives, the sad sequel to the lifeboat disaster is recorded. The coffins of John Cocking and his father, the coxswain, are born from the widowed mother's home. Matthew Barber, another victim, is buried on the same day, and the whole town mourns. The funerals of the other men who lost their lives are to follow. Tom Cocking, another son, walks with his sisters, and supported on her way to the church is another heartbroken mourner. They were brave men, these lifeboatmen, who gave their lives to save others. In a graveyard overlooking the stormy sea, they rest in peace. Cocking, Peters, Smith, the names of the lifeboat crewmen don't change much over the years. Even today, the young men of St. Ives compete eagerly for the chance of the next regular jacket. And it's not for the money, which is nominal. The Cox gets a modest regular wage, but only during the winter. It's a matter of honor. The discipline can be severe. Well, I have no favorites in my life. They're all in the good books as long as they don't cross me. And if any of them cross me, look out. One crossed me Saturday. What happened? It's the wrong one to cross. Do something wrong? You don't do it wrong a second time. They do as I tell them. And I said, once I get the message from the on sec lunch, I've got 40,000 pounds and six men responsible for. If I go out, I make one mistake, I drown the lot. When did you first want to be a member of the lifeboat crew? <laughs> well, that was from uh, boyhood days. Caroline Parsons, she was the first motor lifeboat we had. And uh, she was christened 1933. Well, I carried the bottle of champagne in a basket down across the front that day with my grandfather. And lifeboat's in the family. It's been in the family, and it will be always in the family, I hope. And from that day I got in the boat, my ambition was to go behind that wheel with a white top hat on. That's coxswain of the boat. And I waited 15 years for that. Now there's another cocking waiting, his son, boy Tommy. Well, I want to ask you. What? I was at your six hands, and I can't get aboard the boat. Well, <laughs> look, you put me in a funny position. I was six hours there a fortnight more. I can't have it. You put me in a funny position. Who's that? You said man's four. No, as we are now, we're six hands. I can take a volunteer whenever I like. I take you on, permanent. First thing somebody's gonna say, well, favorites again. I can't have no favorites since Joe. Well, have you, you got favorites? And what you were saying is everyone you got with the boat is a favorite. No, no, no. How is it gonna be a favorite? Well, I don't know. That's what I look at. Well, he had me. Now look, I got you and Noah. Signed up for a first day certificate, tonight. What you're saying is, if I haven't got a first day certificate, I ain't got a smell in. Hey, you got a smell in. A spit got... all. And you got, you got a smell in. If you pass that certificate test, I could join the crew. You could be near enough in the crew. Ah, near enough. But like, what you're saying is, I could be in the crew. Yeah. But if I haven't got the first day certificate, I can. Yeah, you can be in the crew as a volunteer. Well, that's what I want. Well, I'm all right. You're a volunteer. Yeah. And if you're there, you go, don't he? Yeah. What well, more do you want? I, mean, I, I can't look up, if somebody said well, to me, are you in the yes, crew? Me, will he? I can't look up and say yes, because I aren't. Well, you can't say you're in the crew, can you? You haven't got no name on the board. Well, I mean, I aren't in the crew, don't I? Yeah, you can be a volunteer yeah, crewman. Yeah, I fed up with people that are saying, are you I in the crew? I have five or six volunteer crewmen. What you're saying, on, this first aid thing is, the only thing that's going to get me in that crew is a piece of paper, and I don't want that. If that's the case, I soon stop out altogether. Well, yeah, no, first aid, you know, you've got to work aboard the boat as well. Oh, I don't know nothing about boats. I haven't been aboard a boat in my life. Oh. And all I learned you, you don't know bugger all about that. Obviously not, or else you'd ah. have me. 
All I taught you, you don't know nothing about. Not Ob a damn thing Obviously about. not, because you just huh? said yourself you've got to work aboard a boat. Well, it's waste time you go aboard a boat with me any time in that case. Well, that'll leave the bugger going. Huh? Just have to leave him drop, won't right, it? leave him drop. In between the running battle with his father, boy Tommy has to be content working on a fishing boat. But at 18, his heart is set on the lifeboat. Until the day his father relents and gives him his jacket, he works for one of the best-known fishermen in St. Ives, the biggest employer in the harbour, Dan Painter. Dan owns two boats, together worth around £40,000. How's it going? Water slick. What does that mean? Well, it's ground sea. You can't see. The, they won't see any hooks. That's, you've got a job to see the hooks over the side. Go oh, ahead, Johnny. What are you fishing for? Mackerel. We've got our bait, see? We're trying to catch some bait. How long has young Tommy been working for the Painter family? Oh, Tommy, but they're on and off left school. Skiff boys. They used to be the skiff boys. All right. <laughs> Before he became a successful businessman, Dan's heart, too, belonged to the lifeboat. He served on it for many years and became a hero and medal winner during a legendary rescue when a party of potholers became trapped in a sea cave with the tide rising. This is the cave here. This one here. That's the one we went in. Well, we took the skiff, we, four of us went in, the present coxswain, Tommy Cochran, coxswain Dan Roach, and uh, Jack Painter, my cousin. Inside, right inside the cave, there's a rock in the middle. But with the ground sea, we knocked the bottom out of the skiff and she just broke up. And you know, with the tide, with two, with two entrances like that, inside the cave is turmoil. Where the two tides meet inside, it's turmoil. In you couldn't hear, couldn't hear a thing with a sea break. What was the worst moment? I think the worst part was the youngsters screaming and that, you know, because they didn't know what they was going through. They knew they was in there and they had to get out. And they could, well, they could see the sea breaking across the entrances. So what we did then, well, I came out on the rope. Well, I, I didn't have a rope to come out with, but I, I came out and swam out. What, on your own? Yes. And why did you do that? Well, there was no other way. So what were you trying to do? To get out. We was trying to get out from the lifeboat. Well, could you swim? No. Well, I had a life jacket on, you see. I was exhausted when I, before I was out. And then, um, Mike had to go in again with the line. Mike went in again with the line to tie them all afast, and we took every life jacket. We had, all right, Johnny. Mm -hmm. We had every life jacket uh, from the lifeboat. Tied it fast to pull in on this line. <laughs> they came out like tin cans floating, because they was all tied a little distance apart, you see. And they all came out on a string. We were called out about two years after that on the same thing again, but they got out and was the same cave. What, the same? Same cave, yeah. But they came out this time, what, they through the hole in the hillside? They came out through the top. Yeah. Yes, I see. Yeah, we'll what? call up again on the same job. What did you think when you seemed to be going out for a repeat? Shook. <laughs> Fright. Fright. Well, yeah. You were frightened? Well, you, everybody's frightened. Everybody get frightened. I never gone out yet unless I've been frightened. Shake, shake it at the time when them rockets go. You just, well, you, well, I do anyway. I, I'm only speaking for myself. I used to shake. In the middle of the day, there's a real emergency.
Most of the town turns out whenever the St Ives lifeboat is launched. Well to the fore are boy Tommy and his many rivals for a regular life jacket, all desperately trying to be conspicuously useful. The Cox always takes one and often two volunteers from their ranks. John Secretary's place is with the Coast Guard coordinating. On the beach, the Cox chooses two volunteers. Boy Tommy is one of them. This is an Ice Coast Guard, negative. Land's End Coast Guard and uh, Chopper 528 will all work on Channel Zero. Over. The on secretary oh, is Captain you. Eric Kemp. Uh, a man has fallen over the cliffs near Gurnard's Head, about six miles to the west southwest of here. A helicopter has been dispatched to try and save him. He's disappeared into the water. He may be alive. And because he's alive, or we think he might be alive, we've sent the lifeboat to back up the helicopter to see if it can help. You wanted to be Cox once, didn't you? Yes, I... I, I had the thoughts about me over that job. And I went to the on-sec. I went to the on-sec. And he said to me, he told me straight, he said, you haven't got a chance, Dan. So I which way? I up and told him I had an accident, lost the sight of my eye. Your eye? Which one? The right eye. It doesn't show? No, it don't show. Who was the last cox you served under? Dan Roach. Dan Roach. Now, you resigned just before Tommy Cocking took over. I resigned when Dan finished. I finished the same time. I finished the same time. Why was that? I didn't like the self-writing boat. What was wrong with it? It was a new boat, self-writer. We already lost two. Caroline Parsons and the other one up, Kadrivi. John Liza Stitch. We lost her. I said, well, I'll never win a self-writer. And I never put my foot aboard a self-writer since. I've never... I may be prejudiced over things like this, but I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't go aboard. for the young man who fell into the sea gradually recedes, but he is frequently spotted being thrown about in the surf.
For the crew, it's just another job. Aboard the lifeboat is no place for the faint-hearted. Eventually, the rescue attempt becomes a bid to recover the body. It's an Irish lifeboat, this is Land's End Alpha. An object has been sighted in the water approximately 100 to 150 yards ahead of you. Could you investigate, please? Hold on. But conditions are impossible. The risks for the living are too great. It's an Ives lifeboat. This is Land's End Alpha. Helicopters now return to station. It suggests that due to the position, you will be unable to recover. Suggesting you call off search and return to station. Over. It's an Ives lifeboat. This is Land's End Alpha. Thank you, assistance. How? You mean that's it? That's it. Yeah. The old community of St. Ives respects a code of behaviour handed down through generations. For the faithful, it's strict and divinely inspired. Those who go down to the sea share an unquestioning loyalty towards their fellow men. On the fateful night of January the 23rd, 1939, when the lifeboat launched into the hurricane, there was a break in tradition. What happened has been kept a close secret through four decades. Now Survivor Freeman reveals what happened. Just as I got there, the man gave his jacket up and he coughed and said, uh, so I want somebody to go. So I said, all right, well, I go. I'll do, I said. All right, he said, you'll do. So I went there then and put the jacket on. Did you know him? Yes, I know him, yes. But he was an older man than me. I suppose he thought it might have been too much for him, you know. You couldn't see, you couldn't see the sea. It was just like soap suds, you know, all white as far as the eye could see. So you knew this man? Yes, I knew the man. Well? I knew him well, yes, he was a fisherman. Yes. You see, in this community, that must have been a hard decision to take. Who was that man? I don't think you ought to say the man's name, do you? I shouldn't. He's a cousin of mine, too, you know, I might not like it. See? Danger is a reality which St. Ives fishermen have to face regularly. The coast of North Cornwall is one of the most treacherous in the world. 
Nearly every family has lost someone to the sea. And no one is more aware of this than John Stevens. How many members of your family have been lost at sea? Oh, my, you said something, Mr. Doctor. The year 1934, 12th of September, I lost two of my brothers in an accident here about four to five miles from the head. They was in a boat which father had built. I got a part of her. <coughs> and it was a fog, but the fog was patchy. Up comes a steamer from Lorient called the Mousley Moyak. They run into her and drown them. Only two of them survived. There were five in the crew, but my two, I had three brothers in, and one saved his life. He was the skipper of the boat. <coughs> and the other three men dr drowned. My, <coughs> their bodies have been out there and all gone, but not their souls. Their souls are in heaven, where they came from where yours and mine come from. Were the bodies ever recovered? No. Nope. No. Nope. Nope. John Stevens was among the first on the slipway in 1939 when the Maroons went up on the night of the disaster. In those days, the lifeboat had no tractor. It took 80 men on two ropes to drag her into the sea. It was on the 23rd of January, 1939. So the lifeboat rocket, the Maroons went off with the lifeboat and it was blown a 90 mile an hour gale. Well, I said, this is gonna be a job. There's, there, she's only gonna be half man today. The second coxswain, he never heard the Maroons at all. Anyway, I dressed to go in her. I wasn't one of the regular crew. She had a fixed crew at that, at that time. Anyway, I went down, and when I found out where she was going, I thought to myself, she'll never get there, 14 miles to western of the head. The sand from Porthmere was blowing over all the houses on the lifeboat slip. So I thought I'd give them a hand to launch. The pressure was on to get the lifeboat out to a stricken freighter with 40 hands on board, who were all to die that night. Two men lived to tell the story, survivor Freeman and John Stevens. As the lifeboat came to the slipway, something curious happened. It was to haunt John Stevens for the rest of his days. But when I passed the light and my brother-in-law seen me, he said, John, he said, go with us, will you? I could see there's only four men now. I said, so then the coxswain came around, the bow of her. He said, yes, Captain, he said, go with us, will you? So I thought, I says, all right, I'll go. I was hoping that he, I was thinking that he wouldn't put her outside of the bay. <clears throat> and uh, I went aboard to take this jacket. The life jacket was on the, on the deck, so I took it. And it was like a lump of lead in my hands, when they're only featherweight. So I was going to start to put it on, or go over the side to put it on. But as I neared the edge of the boat, the side of the boat to go take the ladder, there was voices, voices. So I looked, I looked, there's nobody here. Who's speaking? Who's speaking? And the voices came louder and louder and louder. And as I was going to the side of the boat to get over to put the jacket on, the voices was buzzing my two ears, plain speech, Drop that jacket, drop that jacket. It's incessant, which stopped me. So I said, yes, I've heard them before, my angels. But they were distinct voices, because I wanted to put the jacket on. So I had the courage then to say to the cox, and I said, Bar, I said, you give this jacket to somebody else. Why did you say you would go? I don't know. What made you say it? I couldn't tell you. I just said I'd go the once. I then I he said put the jacket on. I spoke to um, Matthew Barber. 
And I was, I suppose I was whimpering, really, and he said, go home, he said, she's safe as houses. That's the last words he said to me. He was on board the boat and as he well? he was gone then. So I gave them a hand to lunch. And do you know, it was a low water lunch right off the end of the West Pier. And she was, she was afloat in the water and she was pre proceeding straight to the rocks. The rudder hadn't dropped. Anyway, before she touched the rocks, she just had room and turned around and went over all that broken water just like a, like a flying bird. And that was the end of it. And it didn't seem as if we was gone very far before. Say so took her on the starboard bow and she capsized. <coughs> All of them went out that time. That's her brother, William Barber, Coxon, and Edgar Bassett. Them four went the first time. That'd be Coxon Tommy Cocking, wouldn't it? And uh, when she righted herself, and William Barber. I had my legs hanging over the side and uh, with some rope. Anyway, somebody give me a hand board. Dick said the only thing I can do is try her again. So he went, uh, she wasn't electric starting, you know, she was handle start, you see. So he went and while he was trying her again, I went in under the canopy. I said, I said to them two there, I said, I'm going to now, boys. I said, take it to shore somewhere. So uh, then she, while Dick was there about the engine, she capsized. That was the second time. And Dick went out of her. And the other two were still hanging on. After a while, she capsized the third time. Did you see any of them go on the first capsize? I seen capsize. the other two go. Yeah, they passed, they passed out like... <laughs> yes, I thought when they went, I said, well, I'm by myself now. But I didn't have time enough to think, being by myself, that uh, before she landed, I thought lots of times, how oh, didn't they two hang on just for that minute? See, the young one was capsized twice, and then the third time, they, by some means, they left go. Did you see them go? Yes. <clears throat> I saw the two of them go. And uh, she was on the point of capsizing again when she landed on the rocks on her side. So all I had to do then was step out of her. And when it comes seven o'clock, of January months, it's pitch black outside. So I could see a little bit of daylight coming in, move the curtains every now and then to have a peek to see what was going on. And. Um, I thought I'd go down the wharf again now. The children were quiet. I think Susan had gone to sleep. And uh, as I was going down the road, I met her, a neighbour. She's dead now. She lived over the, over across the way. So she said, oh, it's awful, Margaret, isn't it? I said, the weather is terrific. So she said, I mean the lifeboat. I said, what's the matter with the lifeboat? I said, 
And she looked horrified at me. You know, I said, my husband is in that lifeboat. <coughs> well, I never saw her disappear. She just completely vanished from me. She went like the wind. And I, of course, I started to cry then. Well, with that, I went home to my mother. She never knew anything about it. Father had been out and he hadn't come back. I brought it out to poor mother that the lifeboat had gone. So, of course, Mother went screaming out as well now at the back door. I can see her now, poor old son, because she knew John was in, you see, her eldest boy, you see. And she knew that Willie had gone too, because she was down the wharf as well when the lifeboat went and all that sort of thing. I remember my, husband, my brother saying to me, uh, take her in, Margaret, take her in, because she was down crying, oh, you want going, you shan't go, and all that sort of thing, you know. Well, then, um, well, I should think it was up six o'clock before Willie came home. Up six o'clock, Willie, when you were over there all day, weren't you? And, um... What did you say to him? Oh, what could I say? When he came in, poor fella, I hardly knew him. Well, he was, in a, he was in a bad way. I seen him in his house as soon as he was brought home, and he was all, his face was all black and blue. He was in a terrible state. He hasn't done, a, I don't think he's done any work of any note since. In uh, fact, I don't go near the boat anymore now. Not further than the top of the pier. The strange thing was, there was a boat going out one day there, and I was looking at it, and she was rolling a bit when she was going out. And you know, I had to turn away, I felt sick. <laughs> I was on the pier, yes. And, yeah. How did St. Ives react to the tragedy? Oh, dear, 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 dear. <clears throat> yes, we, we were... Oh, I don't, you can hardly imagine what it was like here. But the funerals, oh, my. The men, the men came here from all around, from the Tamar Bridge down. They all came to go to the funerals. All over Cornwall. Seafaring men. Because they knew. Lifeboat tradition says that as you bury your dead, the boat in which they perished must be destroyed by fire. Do you ever talk to John Stevens about that night? No. Never. I don't talk about it to anyone. No. Well, what do you say when you meet him? Meet him? Oh, no, we just pass on. I didn't say anything to him, just pass on. <coughs> Did anyone ever talk to you about it? Never. So the fact that you took your jacket off has never been mentioned to you by any of the other fishermen in St. Ives? No, no, no. From that day to this? That's right. Never said, nobody's never said a word or raised it to me. And do you know me and Freeman, they, we won't even look at, speak to each other. We haven't spoken to each other since because of memories. But you live close to each other? You pass each other? Oh, yes, yes. You married the first cousin of mine. I, th I think I should, I think we should speak to each other. Uh, and that would probably be the best way of getting over it. Understand? But there we are, we haven't. Well, who's going to make the first move? Pardon? Someone's got to make the first move. Yeah. I've thought upon it many times. My, my, all my family, they all speak to him, of course. <laughs> Not me. <clears throat> John Stevens paid a high price for what happened on that night in 1939. So too did survivor Freeman. But then service with the lifeboat always did demand a sacrifice of some kind. You obviously have had to make financial sacrifices to stay on as Cox. Yet, years ago, plenty of young men also wanted to be Cox. Well, you got the job, and yet, isn't it true that now your rivals are far better off than you? Um, put in this way, if I was a boat owner, I should be tied. 
to a boat. I don't think that the money would draw me away from the lifeboat, it wouldn't. I would do this job, I would do this job for nothing. Lifeboat job. I didn't care if they'd pay me or no, I would do it for nothing. As I am now, I've got in the position where I wanted to get, this Cox and the lifeboat. And uh, my father, my grandfather, he was a good man. He was one of the best. And I got a big reputation to stand up to. And I've got to try to do it. My father always told me, he said, uh, he was never afraid of anything. Well, I can tell you this now. I'm not afraid of anything. I respect what, what don't be afraid to see any time. I'm not afraid of it. The day I get afraid of it, I'll pack it in. But uh, respect what you're on. It's never been mastered. They've mastered the sky and all that, love, but they've never mastered the sea. When I see it, there was a lot of water and a lot of weight. Would there be any occasion when you would refuse to take the lifeboat out? No. As far as I'm concerned, if there's men out there to save, I'll go and get them. And I think my crew are in the same mind. I don't care what the weather is. I don't care how bad it's blowing. If the on sec informed me there's a casualty out there to lunch and people aboard of her, I shall walk out of this house or wherever I am and shove off two maroons. As far as I'm concerned, she'll go. That's me. There's one remaining test of courage. How are we? All right. You, you aren't too good. No. No. No breath. Pardon? No breath. No breath. No. How are we? Yes. Oh, you do? That's all right. Yes. For a tick, this is nearly 37 or 8 years since we've spoken to each other. Yes. For, not for any reason. No, no, no but reason. whenever I see you, I get full of emotion. Why, John? Why should it be? We aren't here long enough for that. No, I get, uh, I get uh, emotional. Yes. You know, the thoughts to travel back. Yes. Understand? See? <clears throat> yes. Yes. I'm just having a rest you on can... the wall a minute. <clears throat> well, there haven't been much fish up the east, like a blonde. No. But he fell in. We had at some red stone of souls, that's oh. true. And they They're made right, 14 no. pounds of stones. Mm -hmm. A pound a pound for souls. Yes. Now, you had three stone of bass. They mm -hmm. made 10 pounds of stones. <laughs> <laughs> 